<laughs> Less than 11.6. We're going to get focused now. If you recall from Friday, this is our lesson talking about hypothesis and what was it, writing? Introduction to hypothesis testing. So we talked about two types of hypotheses, which we already mentioned, right? Yep. Null and alternative. Our null hypothesis is the one where whatever's going to happen isn't going to be affected by anything. It's just any variation will just be due to chance. Okay? And then the alternative hypothesis is that's a hypothesis where there is some outside force affecting and any variation in that those amounts are not due to just chance, but in the case that we've been talking a lot about, the fuel additive, right? Okay. And so if you real briefly go back and review, okay, we started off looking at this car is being 34.6 miles per gallon with a fuel additive 35.5. Our hypothesis, our questions were, okay, how would we test this? Is the increase in mileage really due to the fuel additive? Okay, so we wrote a couple hypotheses, a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. Um, here was another example of writing null and alternative. Alternative. Okay, over here, we had 10, or 10 pieces of information, right? Five without the additive, five with the additive. And we looked at those means. And when we looked at those means, we found the difference between the means to be 0.76. So we talked about how that 0.76 is kind of close together, but yet, you know, kind of makes, these two means are kind of close together, but yet they're not identical, are they? Okay, so to review a little bit, the null hypothesis would be, you know, the additive is not making any difference. So essentially those means are the same, or the difference between them is zero. The alternative hypothesis would be when you subtract them, you get some number greater than zero. Okay. Our question here, is this 0.76 difference? Is it due to the additive or just by chance? Okay. So then we went on, and I'm reviewing this because otherwise you won't remember at all where we're at in this process. So then we went on and we said, okay, well, we're going to try and mix those groups up some. And so we had our first group mix up here, right? They reorganized took the 10 values, mixed them into two different groups. We found the means, right? And then we subtracted these means. This time there was a difference of only 0.08. Now, 0.08 puts those two groups very close together. And I don't know exactly how it was written on Friday, but the idea is if there is no difference in the groups with and without the additive, that number should be close to zero, or it should be zero. Now, as we've talked all chapter, is one simulation or one testing really enough to tell? No. Not really. So now, let's look at another randomization of the group. We have the same 10 values. This time, they said one group has these values. So there's five of the 10 values listed there. First part, identify the data values for the other group. So go up to your chart here. Which ones were these? Were they 34.1, 36.7, 35.1, 36.1, So what does that mean the other group has in it? 34.8, 36, 32.9, and 33.1. Easy enough, I just listed the other five. The bottom part of this asks us to calculate the difference of the means for the two groups. In order to calculate the difference of the means, that means we need to find both means. So if you would, grab the calculators and find the means. And similar to what we have been doing, the values they gave us, I'm going to call group one. The values we listed out, I'm going to call group two. So I'm looking for information about mean one and mean two.
What you got? Uh, group one is 35. Okay. I agree. Now, I will say for group one, when you add these numbers, 178.8 divided by 5, and I do agree with the 35.76. Group two, when you add them, you get 170.6. Divide by 5, and you're at 34.12. So it asks us to find the difference of the mean. So how do I find the difference? I take the 2 and subtract them. Now, my thing is to subtract them, I feel like the easiest way to say is just always do bigger minus smaller. In this case, that means I'm doing the 35.76 minus the 34.12. And what is that difference? 1.6 what? 4. Okay. Now, with that in mind, sorry, can you guys make sure everyone gets the information? that in mind. In the previous example, those groups, the difference was 0.08, right? And actually, if you go back to the original, before we started mixing the groups up, the original difference was the 0.76. We mixed it up, we're at 0.08. We mix it up again, we're at 1.64. Do we have a definite answer really yet? No, 0.08 is really close together. 1.64? Not very close together. So, what's this mean technically you do? Lots more sample runs, right? Lots more trial runs. Now, I say technically, what's this mean we do? Lots more trial runs. What did they already do for us? Lots more trial runs. Okay. So, here is a the idea of using a simulation results to test the hypothesis. So, they have a histogram representing... Um, and you'll notice it says, how can continued randomization of the gas sludge data be used to test the hypothesis in the previous example? So, I honestly don't remember how many of these add up to be. It's probably about 200, I'm guessing, just by looking at, you know, the number of frequencies there. But what you're noticing here, first of all, this... Bottom axis is, notice this is x bar 1 minus x bar 2. You guys remember, x bar is another way to also say mean, correct? U is mean, x bar is mean. You use them interchangeably. They're both good here. So this is saying the difference between the two means. Now, this one is being very set in that there's positives and negatives. But as you look at this, positives and negatives. We have a lot in the middle here, don't we? However, we still have a decent amount out here. Um, the line they have pointing out, compared to samples generated at random, the original difference of sample means is not that unusual. I think they're representing negative 0.76, whereas technically when we wrote it, we had positive 0.76. Okay, so if you look, though, there's a lot that fall in that category. There's still others that don't. And the question was, how can continued randomization of the gas mileage data be used? Well, A, multiple different groups. Okay, so continue creating two new groups and figuring out the means and the differences. Now, when we start looking at how often... was this different? And you can look and say, and I believe, I'm not going to go into the details here, but this difference is greater than 0.76 about a quarter of the time. Okay? Now, if that difference is greater than 0.76 about a quarter of the time, again, we don't really have enough information yet to say that additive isn't working. 
because it's still working a decent amount of the time, isn't it? And this is where the direction we're trying to go is, okay, is that additive working? Is it not? A big part of the issue right here, how many numbers were we adding and dividing? We just had groups of five, right? Is five numbers really a lot to add and divide? Not if you're trying to average something, right? Five, that's not one number that's extra big or extra small is easily going to throw that off. The more numbers, the better we're going to have. So we're going to go back to the idea that a bigger sample size is going to be better. And that's where I believe it's this next one we'll look at. Okay. So I'm going to write some information out just to kind of answer the question so you have some information down. Um, how can the randomization help? Well, one, one comment I'm going to say is to continue to create two new groups. So in other words, do that repeatedly, right? That's one option. Continue to create two new groups and find means and differences. Okay, so that's one thing you want to do is continue to find those groups, find the means and differences. And this particular one, based on looking at the frequency or the histogram, the difference of means was greater than 0 0.76 about a quarter of the time. And again, that's viewed by looking at our history on there. And then because it's, you know, we don't have all the information, enough information yet, it's going to go down to picking bigger samples. So, Small samples do not give convincing evidence the additive improved gas mileage. Okay, I guess the comment, I'll explain this in a moment, cannot, so we don't have the evidence yet to reject the null hypothesis. So cannot reject null hypothesis with this data. Now, if you go back and look, our null hypothesis was that the both groups would be about the same, so the difference between them would be zero. We have some close to zero, but we still have a decent amount away from zero. So that's why we don't have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis yet. Okay. Now, when you start looking at the bottom part, What's the bottom part do? Gives us not just five in each group, but 10 in each group, I think. Yeah. So you can start finding the means of those two groups if you have what you need written down from this page. Which is 
just want to try and make sure we all have what we need here. Looks like it. Okay. The fuel additive was tested again, resulting in the data displayed below. Use a simulation to randomly assign the data into new, the two new groups, which is done. Find the difference of the means of the original sample and the new groups you just created. How do they differ? Like I've done every step of the way, I'm going to label these groups one and two. What you got? You got information for me? I do not have 33.25 exactly. 32. Okay. Yeah. Which comes from, you actually add it and get 332.4. You divide it by 10. It's 33.24. What was the second one? 30. Yeah. So 35.74 means we, yes, added to be 357.4. Divided by 10, we get 35.74. So, and like all the others, find their difference. Subtract mean 2 minus 1, or as I said, just think bigger minus smaller. That's the easier way to think about it. What do I get when I subtract these? I'd say to you. <clears throat> the groups aren't close together at all, are they? So what's that indicating? The additive's working, right? The farther apart those groups are, <clears throat> okay, in other words here, this group with the additive is getting two and a half miles per gallon better fuel mileage on average, right? And so, and this was just the difference of having 10 in each sample instead of five in each sample. Okay, and that makes a big difference right there because that makes it more obvious. Um, obviously you can run more simulations and um, get the information that backs that up. But what I'm gonna say here is that to save us any more work, we do have the information we need at this point. Okay, that 2.5 is a definite, it's not one that makes you think, is it or is it enough? It is enough. So it's clear that the 2.5 is greater than the difference of means in most samples. So most everything else we've done, we haven't had anything like 2.5. Okay, so for that reason, we can reject the null hypothesis because the null hypothesis is the one that says they're about the same, right? And then we can... I want to say accept. I think they use the alternative hypothesis is supported is what is the vocabulary you'll see in the office. Okay. So I'm going to write some information again. It is clear that 2.5 is greater than most, pre actually I'm just going to say most differences. Okay, so the null hypothesis can be rejected, and I'm trying to use the vocabulary, you'll see them use, and alternative hypothesis is supported. Okay. 
And so at this point, if we're saying that the null hypothesis is rejected and the alternative hypothesis is supported, we're saying this change in gas mileage is not just due to chance, but due to the fuel additive, right? So I'm going to write that also. Difference in gas mileage is not due to chance. but due to additive. one more, I say one more example on the back side, but it's basically one big example, and we get to get away from talk about the fuel additive. We're going to talk about best bet mac and cheese, because why not, right? For the record, I do not come up with these examples. I take them out of the book, so just saying. I read this, and I think best buy mac and cheese, so... Okay, Best Bet Mac and Cheese reports that the average price for a box of their product is $1.45. A marketing company selects a national sample of 100 retail prices. The standard deviation of prices nationally is $0.20, cents, and the mean of the prices of the samples is $1.65. Does this study provide strong evidence that Best Bet's claim is false? Okay, so read that question there. Does this study provide strong evidence that Best Bet's claim is false? And what was their claim? Best Bet says that the average price of their product is $1.45, right? So this marketing company is saying, does this study provide strong evidence that their claim is false? So this marketing company is claiming what? This marketing company is trying to say Best Bet's claim is false. Okay. Now, step one we're going to do. Write the null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis for this study. Well, first of all, I'm overwriting these words out. So, remember for null hypothesis, I was using H sub zero. For alternative hypothesis, I was using H sub A. Yes? That's how you'll see them denoted in Sabus. My recommendation, I don't know, I like to start with, the, start with the alternative hypothesis sometimes. And the alternative hypothesis is, okay, what is the claim here? And the marketing company is claiming what? Well, they're not claiming it's 165. That's their study. But they're claiming that Best Bet's claim is false. What was Best Bet's claim? That the average price is $1.45, right? So if best if their claim is the average price is $1.45, the marketing company is claiming that's false. So they're claiming that the average price is I'm gonna say not a dollar forty-five. Does that make sense? Okay. So we're gonna claim the alternative hypothesis is that the average price is not $1.45. We don't necessarily have a less than or greater than. Okay? They're just claiming that it's not that. Now, what's the null hypothesis? Right. Okay. That the average price is $1.45. So the null hypothesis is just kind of the basic without any, I say without anything changing or whatever, but basically what Best Bet's claim is. Their claim was $1.45. The marketing company is saying that that's false. It's not $1.45. 
Okay, I'm going to make you dig in your brains. In order to help figure this out, step two asks, suggests that we find the margin of error. Okay, well, we had a formula. Not 11.6, but back in 11.5. Actually, we had two formulas for margin of error. Do you remember any of them? Okay, so you guys had the right idea. 2 sigma over square root of n, which is 2 times the standard deviation divided by square root of n, which is the sample size. Ring some bells then, right? You didn't have to dig out your 11.5 notes. I'm so impressed. It's in there some. And that's from like several days ago. <coughs> okay, do the math. 2 times, what's our standard deviation? 0.2 divided by square root of n. What's n? The 100 samples. Okay. 2 times 0.2. My brain says 0.4. Divided by square root of 100. Square root of 100 is 10. So 0.4 divided by 10? 0.04. Now, that is our margin of error. What is this problem talking about in terms of numbers? Percentage. Not percentage. It's all money, right? Dollars. So this is actually for what? Four cents. Okay. If we had an easier, a reason to turn it into percent, yes, it's four percent. But... Everything else is in terms of dollars and cents, so we're going to talk about this being four cents. Okay. Use the sample statistic and margin of error to predict a range of reasonable values. Do you remember doing this? Yeah. This is where we did the sample mean, or that's what we're going to use here. Sample mean plus or minus the margin of error. Now, what is the sample mean here? 65. This is the 165, because we're trying to find that region that or that range that the marketing company is claiming. So 165 plus or minus the four cents that we just found. 165 plus or minus the four cents gives me a range of what? Okay, a dollar sixty one to a dollar sixty nine. That is our range of reasonable values. So, based on the um, national sample that the marketing company does, based on their mean and their standard deviation. The re range of reasonable values is $1.61 to $1.69. So, compare the claim to the predicted interval. What do we know? It's not a dollar forty-five, is it? Okay, so best bets claim that their mean is, uh, their average retail price is $1.45 is not correct, is it? So um, we are going to be able to reject the null hypothesis, if you will. Okay. Um, and that's because it falls outside that range of reasonable values. So I'm going to put that in words. I'm going to say the claim of... A dollar forty five falls outside the range of reasonable values. And that range of reasonable values being the dollar sixty one. 
$2.69. And so for that reason, since it's outside that range, we must reject the null hypothesis. Okay. So we are rejecting bets, bet, best bet mac and cheese hypoth you know, claim. That also means that we would be able to support the alternative hypothesis, right? And that is that the study does the study provide strong evidence that best bet's claim is false. And it does. 145 is definitely outside of that range. Okay, we're going to change it up real quick on the last set. Still talking about best bet mac and cheese, though. And that is best bet revises their claim and reports now an average retail price of $1.60. A second marketing study sampled 300 prices for Best Bet Mac and Cheese, finding a mean price of $1.64. So now, what is the margin of error for the new sample? So, same formula. 2 sigma divided by the square root of n. they give us a new sigma? No, since they didn't give us a new sigma, I guess what I'm going to say. Use the old one. So the old sigma was 20 cents, I believe. So 2 times the square root of 0.2 divided by, or 2 times 0.2 divided by the square root of, ah, this number right here underneath recording, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So you're in, gosh. In value is right there. Just about bit it. Okay, do the math. 0.4 divided by whatever the square root of 300 is. I got zero point for you. What? Yeah, I know it's 0 0.023. It's a big, long, messy decimal, isn't it? But if we're going to make this match the rest of the problem, we need to put this in terms of two decimal places money, right? So 0 0.02. So officially that is going to be 0 0.02 cents. Is Best Bet's revised claim supported by this new study? Explain why or why not. Well, what do we need to find now? Well, we already found the margin of error, but... Yeah. And I'm writing it as new interval, right? So that new range of reasonable values. In order to do that new range of reasonable values, what are we adding and subtracting? The 0 0.2 onto what value? The 164. So 164 plus or minus the 0 0.02. And what's that give me a range of? 162 to 166. So is Best Bet's revised claim supported by this new study? No, because $1.60 is still outside the range of reasonable values. So I'm going to say no. $1.60 is not within the range of reasonable values.
Okay. You have homework. Do tomorrow. I believe there's 10 questions. I think I had 14 to choose from, and I got rid of some that were big, long paragraphs with lots of drop-down boxes that were on the more confusing end to fill in. So see what you can do with the homework. Do the best you can. Let me know if you run into questions, problems. I know this is kind of a, I feel like this is a tough lesson to do homework on, but do the best you can. Let me know what questions you run into. Thank you.